Hello and welcome to Web 3.0 is the evolution. Not everyone will make it. Welcome to the Gen Z video game space that is the metaverse. Uh, this is a presentation by me, Mark Ashmore, as my avatar Asher. Uh, this presentation was given at AV Immersive in Manchester um, on the 1st of December 2022. And what we'll be doing is looking at well, I can tell you exactly what we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking at um, the metaverse and we're going to be looking at Gen Z and we're going to be looking at why it will be that very young generation that will be creating the metaverse. So, first of all, before we kick into that, who am I? Who is Mark Ashmore? Well, <clears throat> clear my voice there. Um, I'm the founder of Future Artists Immersive Arts Labs, which we founded in 2016 to explore the uh, VR space which then evolved really into the early metaverse space and the metaverse technologies that we see there. Although back then we didn't call it that. Um, my main role really is building digital, digital communities and I produce uh, with creators. So I produce theater, I produce film, um, and I produce virtual reality content. And I've just moved into video games as well. Uh, I run multiple businesses. Uh, I'm basically an entrepreneur and I'm in my final year of a PhD at Liverpool John Moores University where my final thesis question will be looking at how Gen Z are consuming music completely differently to their peers, uh, previous peers, um, via using XR technology. So, you know, how they're going to Fortnite gigs, Roblox gigs, um, VR chat rave scene, how NFTs are revolutionising. Um, the copyright music space, that kind of thing. And also, I'm dyslexic, which is my hidden superpower. Um, when I did this talk um, in uh, in Manchester, I where it says, but first practice, I then got everyone to do a little team building exercise. That won't work here, so we're not going to do that. So we're going to skip on to the presentation. So uh, here we go. Okay, so to understand the metaverse... Uh, where we're heading, it's good to give context to see where we began. So, who builds, who disrupts? Who are the builders? So Web 3.0 is built on older ideas, older software, older technology, which was actually built by sort of teenagers and young adults. Although Tim Berners-Lee was 36 years old when he invented the World Wide Web Protocol, which makes my under 30s argument uh, a little bit obsolete. But if you think about it, you've got Microsoft being invented uh, in in garages and Apple II computers coming out of garages and, and you know, the whole kind of Silicon Valley uh, origin story. But around that, there was loads and loads of teenagers and young people hacking together things, messing around with software. And the early internet was actually these bulletin board systems. So I'm going to show you a quick two minutes from this huge documentary. It's on for about eight hours. It's available for free on YouTube and will be in the comments on this channel. Um, but I'm going to show you two minutes now to give you kind of context. You have a conversation. And they're like, why? <laughs> We're going to tee that up properly. So it starts at the beginning. We didn't just suddenly wake up one morning and we had the Xbox. We didn't wake up one morning and the internet was there. You know, how did we get there? That's what you want to know about history for. Oh, are we uh, ready to roll? Yeah, we're rolling. What I have next to me is uh, the first uh, bulletin board in the world, uh, CBBS Chicago. Uh, people wondered if the C stood for Christensen or Chicago or whatever. And, uh, and no, it didn't because there was no such thing as a BBS. So it was a computerized bulletin board system. <laughs> I would, I would enthusiastically describe it to everybody. I'd be telling you know, my relatives, I'm like, so this is, I, I, I would dial up and I'd be talking to other people online, but not really talking, I'd be typing and, and leave the messages and then later I can read more messages and they all go, oh, 
Okay, and they look like you've got some sort of disease or something. I say it's kind of like America Online, but really scaled down, you know? <laughs> and it's, 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 it's not an easy thing to explain. With this program you'd have on your computer, you'd dial a number, and you'd enter your name and password, and it would say hello, and then you could go to the messages, and you could read these messages. And then you could add one. And if you waited long enough, and I had to say months, other people would have called in, and left messages, and after a few months, you have a conversation. And they're like, why? <laughs> you know, they're all in their early 20s, and it's was like, well, that's stupid. I mean, you know, it, and it is stupid. It was unbelievably stupid. I, I try telling it to people now. So, as I said there, they're all in their early 20s, and they're all creating these bulletin board systems. now. I'm going to show you what a bulletin board system is because we've seen these these guys obviously are all in their middle age and um, you've got to think back that when they were doing this they were teenagers and in their 20s um, so let's have a look at how a bulletin board system works um, so to give you the real context so this is a bulletin board system in two minutes a bulletin board system, or BBS, is a computer server running software that allows users to connect to the system using a Telnet program. Once logged in, the user can perform functions such as uploading and downloading software and data, reading news and bulletins, and exchanging messages with other users through email, public message boards, and sometimes via direct chatting. Many BBSs also offer online games in which users can compete with each other Bulletin board systems were in many ways a precursor to the modern form of the World Wide Web, social networks, and other aspects of the internet. To get started, we will enter Telnet at the prompt, followed by the bulletin board we want to connect to. Now we are at the main menu for the BBS. The key features in a BBS are bulletins, of course, files that are available to download, and door games. This BBS doesn't have any files available in our area, but we do have some door games which we can access by pressing D. These are text-based games that you can play while connected to the BBS. They are generally multi-user, so you'll be playing with other BBS users. Lunatics, for example, has you assume the role of a patient at an asylum. The goal is to escape. Now we know what a BBS is and how to connect to one, but how do you find a BBS to connect to? For that, we'll have to switch to a browser and be right back. We are back here. So I'm gonna stop that there because basically they give an example of uh, where you can find a BBS on the internet um, and basically dial into it. Now you wouldn't dial into it on the internet because obviously the technology's moved on, but back in the day, 1978 to the early 1990s, you would have used your modem on your Commodore 64 or your Amiga or PC, and you would dial in using a dialing code, so, you know, those um, sort of six to eight digit numbers, uh, and connect to a board, as you saw previously in the very first video, one of those giant kind of computers, metal computers, basically a server, early server. And then within that, you would be able to connect to other users and talk basically within that computer, within that server. Um, I guess we've evolved to the cloud now with that cloud computing. Um, so that's a BBS, that's a bulletin board system. And what I'm demonstrating here is how people are connecting using hardware and technology that is slow and cumbersome. They're all in their early 20s and they're all creating something radically new. Um, but obviously it evolves. We build upon new technology. A bulletin so, board system or BBS. This is then in 1986, um, sort of six to eight years into this evolution of bulletin board systems. Um, you might have heard of a filmmaker called George Lucas who did a very successful franchise uh, from 1977 to 1983 called the Star Wars Trilogy. Now, George Lucas had a bit of a tax problem coming up. He'd made so much profit from Star Wars and the merchandise and the spin-offs that he, instead of wanting to give it to the, uh, to the tax man, uh, taxed those profits, he wanted to spend those profits on evolving his company and, and creating new divisions. And so he founded 
um, Lucas Games, um, which was became a division of Lucasfilm, um, and they created this this sort of I guess an early metaverse world or an early cyberspace world called Habitat in 1986, which ran on the Commodore 64. So I'm going to show you now a how we've moved from text-based to 2D graphics as an interface to hang out in these virtual spaces, in these virtual worlds. Five cents, Pops. The name's not Pops. I just want to find out about this here parallel world. Uh, it's called Habitat, but cough up that dope, Pops. No playing games. Jimmy, the name's not Pops. Look, I promise I'll pay you as sure as my name is... Valentino. Valentino? What's going on here? What kind of game are you playing, Pops? Pops and his friend Jimmy aren't the first people to get drawn into this strange new world where names can change as quickly as events, surprises lurk at every turn, and the keynotes of existence fantasy and fun here in a place called Habitat. What's a uh, teleport boot? <coughs> Where am I? And who in the heck are you? It is said that boredom once ruled the lifestyles of the avatars, the beings who populate this world. But recently, all that changed. With the birth of an alliance between powerful beings, both here in Habitat and in the human realm, and with the cooperation of a huge mainframe computer in Virginia. Now, using their modems and Commodore computers, people from Westport to Walla Walla can join Quantum Link and Lucasfilm on an electronic journey unlike any other. One that leads to Habitat, where thousands of avatars, each controlled by a different human, can converge to shape an imaginary society. Hey, listen, my real name's Henry. Uh, they call me Pops. I, I mean... No, thickwit. Henry's your human. He's just controlling you. Here you get to be someone else. Well, th th then I, I guess I really am Valentino. Talk about great expectations, lover boy. Now let me be a minute. I got some digging to do and some treasure to find. It is a place full of drama and adventure, a place where a thousand and one things can happen simultaneously, making the possibilities here positively unpredictable. So, rest assured, our Mr. Valentino will hardly be alone. Hot dog, a hole! For example, Swell Dreller here is an avatar controlled by Luann Smith from Beverly Hills, here on a quest for high magic. And high magic is just what she's found, here in a land lies beyond her wildest dreams. A crystal ball. Oh, maybe it will take me away from this dull tropical paradise. What I want is adventure. Yeah, and, and what about me? Ask the Oracle. So, just to recap that one there, so you just some, some of the highlights is that you've got, a, we've moved there from, it's still text-based, you're still typing in. Um, we've got a 2D graphical representation of our avatars. And as you saw there, there was uh, some, some lady in Beverly Hills um, controlling the female representation of an avatar here on the screen. And then Pops Valentino, who, as you saw at the beginning, picked up the newspaper and was interested in this parallel universe that um, people have been talking about. And he was sucked in to the computer to go on this adventure. What we're beginning to see here is that the understanding that they the can be residing inside a mainframe computer, as I said, in Virginia, where all these users, <coughs> excuse me, thousands of users, users are coming together to play mini games effectively um, and text-based adventures within one defined world. 
Now, you can check out the Wikipedia on Habitat. Um, it had thousands of users um, at its uh, at its peak. It never went massively mainstream, mainstream because of the cost to actually dial in to the Quantum Link um, uh, servers and things was was quite expensive. You know, you're dialing out of state, so it, it co- the cost per minute to play this would be expensive. Obviously, it was, it's slow and it was clunky, but it actually laid the foundations for what you saw in Second Life and then all the other evolutions of these digital worlds, which brings us on to something a little bit more um, a little bit more modern and to bring us right up to date is to look at Roblox which um, began life in 2006 as really a physics teaching game of how to program um, computers and has evolved over um, nearly two decades now um, into a huge world of millions of uh, creator avatars um, creating their own world so you can see the evolution here so I'm going to show you two minutes of this um, and give you some examples of uh, of what we're up to welcome to I'm your target demographic today we're covering the basics of something called Roblox this is intended for people who don't know what this is so if you play or you're a fan of Roblox this might be a handy video to share with friends or family that could use some help understanding it imagine Roblox is a platform for many different types of games and experiences. If you are interested, you could actually create games in this platform for anyone to play. Most people might just be consumers as opposed to creators, finding their favorite games to spend time with. There is a way to spend and earn real life money here, so some games or items within games might cost money, paying those creators who made it. Roblox also puts a high emphasis on your avatar the character that appears in the game world as you. You can earn items and customization, but you can also spend currency to buy them. The currency in this game is called Robux and is purchased from real life money. If someone else is playing Roblox, but it's your account or your credit card attached, make sure you've looked into settings to make sure that they're not racking up charges buying the craziest of outfits. Now let's address the question, is Roblox for kids? That might be your first assumption, mostly due to the art style. But think of this more like Legos, something that even adults can have fun with, especially on the game creation side. Roblox has spent a lot of time evolving their security and privacy settings. So there are certain games off limits to anyone under 13, for example. There are also strict chat controls. So if you're a parent, you can control who can, or if anyone can, chat with your child. Let's look at some examples of what types of games people can play. What we're seeing now is an example of a game called Jailbreak. There's a prisoner team and a police team. The prisoners are trying to evade the guards and escape the prison, while the police are trying to beat the prisoners to certain places and stop those criminals from getting out. There's a whole wide world outside the prison, so even if someone escapes, there are vehicles such as drones and cars, and you're ultimately still trying to evade the police. Another popular game right now is called Adopt Me. So I'm just going to leave that there. Um, again, um, you, you'll be able to see the link uh, in the uh, description to go and see this video in its full length. Um, but as you can see there, um, I've tried to show that progression of evolution from the text-based BBS boards up to Roblox, which in 2022 is a publicly listed company and uh, has millions and millions of users per month that are and as it stated there in the video, you've got some section of the community that are the creators, they're building this world, they're building the games within the world, they're building uh, physical infrastructure, they're building costumes, they're building props, they're building um, even characters and things like that. And then you've just got the players, that they're just turning up and they're playing and participating in this world. Maybe they're doing it with friends or they're doing it as a solo player. Many different people are using the space in many, many different ways. It's an evolution as same as our um, human society is that people use spaces and places for many different things. So who are building these spaces? Uh, Roblox is a Gen Z um, space and I want to give you a few takeaways for who um, Gen Z are and why they're the cohort that will be building um, the future of the metaverse. So 
to give you the skinny on this is that um, Gen Z is anybody born after 1995. So in 2022, the oldest Gen Zer will be 27 years old. Um, they've lived through uh, the financial crash of 2008. They've known um, seven prime ministers uh, in the UK. Um, they've got climate change, a cost of living crisis. They've lived through Donald Trump. You've got the rise of China. And you've also got the um, uh, cost of living crisis uh, that we have now. Um, they've also always known the internet. You know, since 1995, we had dial up until about 2001, 2002, then we went to broadband. Now we've got fiber and now we've got, you know, SpaceX and we're beaming satellites of internet technology to the, uh, to the earth via Elon Musk's company there. So the, the Gen Z have always known the internet it's like air to them. They are the first human digital natives. Now, I want to say that again, just for emphasis. They're the first human digital natives. The internet and apps. So the go-to um, things that they consume are, are YouTube and TikTok and uh, Instagram. Um, meme culture, visual culture, videos and video games, social video gaming is their world and so the obviously when you're participating on TikTok it is a video medium so they're having to film themselves they're having to participate and having to be very more outgoing and connecting with each other and because they're digital natives they're they're native and used to this whereas it might seem very alien to um, older millennials and gen x's and boomers so this is why we begin to see a very different world of the digital realms opening up, which is why, in my arguments, it will be Gen Z that go on and create what we're calling the metaverse. So I'm going to wrap this up now. So in summary, um, there's always a misconception between Web 3.0 and Web 3. So Web 3 is a reference to crypto and the NFT space. Now this will be part of Web 3.0, but Web 3.0 is the next evolution of the internet. And this is built on top of Web 2.0. Now as consumers, now consumers is the key word. Remember we've got the creators and we've got the participants, but these are both sets of consumers. As they move from a text-based to uh, Web 2.0 to a video game, 3D graphical based uh, interface and web with video based social media, TikTok and Insta, um, as their primary uh, input. Um, we'll see the rise of discords allowing for freedom of expression and a place to meet your tribe. So discords are obviously invite only networks. So we all move away from uh, everything being out there and everyone being able to connect to being like, you know, if you want to join this tribe for this certain conversation or you're into this certain kind of thing, then there'll be a Discord or something similar to that for you. And then that will give you access to the 3D digital world. This world will have its own currency. It may be some form of crypto uh, and NFTs, or it might be using your credit card to, to pay for tokens and things within it. These are gonna become huge video worlds which will have social events, games, and relationships will be created within them. They'll be played on your device, on your games console, and then you'll use VR and AR to access the 3D worlds, depending on the experience. I mean, I've said this before, is that when we use, uh, you know, when we get inside the metaverse, if we're checking our emails, we don't necessarily need to do that inside a headset. But if we want to go to a concert, maybe uh, putting a headset on is how we want to have the full immersive experience. But then that same concert might be available as a streaming video on your smartphone. Um, and all this right now is being created by hundreds of millions of under 27 year olds globally. Um, you just look at what's happening inside Fortnite, in Roblox, in Minecraft. And now we've got Horizon that's being built. Gen Z are really taking hold and building this ecosystem because they are the first humans that are digital native to this space. It is their space. Web 2.0, though, will still exist. Um, I mean, even now you can log on to bulletin board systems or turn up to an office, you remember those, on a business park because nostalgia is always going to be big business. 
these things will always live next to each other. So there are still people that just text people. There are still people that um, that still believe that uh, you know you can be most productive in getting everybody from different geographical locations to travel an hour and a half into central London to sit in an office and uh, do eight hours of work. Um, so the evolution of all this web 3.0 will be built on top of and exist at the same time as these older softwares and technologies. But anyway, that wraps that up. If you're interested in hearing more, um, jump onto um, my Twitter, drop me a message if you enjoyed watching this. It's always good to get some sort of feedback. Um, we also have this amazing immersive arts lab where there's 1.1 uh, thousand members uh, globally um, if you scan that QR code um, it will take you directly to the uh, Facebook group or if you type in immersive arts lab by future artists into Facebook you should be able to find that group and that's uh, a bunch of us there when we used to meet up um, before the uh, pandemic of 2020 um, we'll be doing more in real life events in the future as well as online events and as well as metaverse events and that's all coming in 2023-24 so be great if you've watched this if you want to get involved but uh, anyway that's enough of me talking i'm going to get rid of my avatar so you can uh, you can take a picture of the qr code and i'll see you soon